podcast exists for the edification and benefit of the people of Noblesville Baptist Church, as well as our surrounding community. Our aim is to use this platform as an additional discipleship tool for the discussion of social, political, and theological topics in order to glorify God and grow in Christ-likeness. Hello and welcome to the NBC After Hours podcast. My name is AJ Walls. I am your host. So glad that you could join us today. And I am joined here with Pastor Seth Lehman. Greetings. Hello, my friends. It's been a while. Yes. And we're here. This is the OG squad. We're here with Pastor Jonathan Tapp. Yes, sir. It's been a long time, OG brother. Squad. <laughs> yes, sir. It's been a little while. We've Roll missed back. you, brother. Miss you guys. You know how sad and lonely it is to just sit across the desk from <laughs> AJ? Yes. It's a burden I, that I bear. I hear you. Hey, Anyhow. For the good of the church, brother. It's not anything worse than the burden of being AJ himself. No, I'm just kidding. Huh. <laughs> it's a blessing. You it's have to blessing. live with you constantly. Yes. That's 24-7. Mm. Mm. Well, mm. Bless Elizabeth. It's, it's Pray scary. For him. Pray for him. <laughs> Well, um, today we're going to be, so we're in this theme, season three, we're gathering testimonies from yes. mm-hmm. some of our dear brothers and well, yeah, I would say been brothers, not brothers and sisters. Yeah, just uh, brothers. our heart in this season, we want to give glory to God for the salvation that he has wrought mm-hmm. in men and women within our church. Mm-hmm. Uh, we started the season with some wonderful testimonies of individuals that God saved out of addiction, Mm -hmm. powerful testimonies, demonstrations of his power and grace. And then we recently, if you got to listen to the last episode as we got to interview Brother Jim Weaver, a very different story, but still a story of God's grace and how God has saved him and redeemed him and used him Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a life of uh, Christian education and ministry. And today we are shifting directions a little bit because we're going to interview one of our own. Pastor Jonathan Tapp, Woo-hoo. peeling back the layers that is <laughs> Little John. Little John. The onion of Jonathan Tapp. I, I the don't onion. know that I've ever been referred to as Little John. That's, that's Which is unique. intriguing because to call you Little John yeah. would be in the true spirit of the Robin Hood tale. That's right. Because yes. Little John wasn't little. That was the irony. That's the irony. And that yeah. surprises huh. me that no one's called you. Little John, because you maybe are... Maybe henceforth. Maybe henceforth. Probably not. It probably won't <laughs> stick. But. Yeah. Anyhow. Yes, happy so, to be here. Yeah, yeah. So so here's how we're going to start it off, right? We, we just want to approach this conversation imagining that someone within our church or someone that knows about Noblesville Baptist Church and knows that you're a pastor here, mm-hmm. but maybe they don't know your story. Like, like, who is Jonathan Tapp? Where did this guy come from? And so, just tell me a little bit about your origins. Where, where yeah. were you born? Yeah. To what type of family were you born into? So, I was born in Searcy, Arkansas. A lot of people don't know that. A little town in Arkansas. My parents went to Harding College down there, Christian school. Hmm. And uh, so, that's where I was born. My mom had some family down that way. Didn't live there long. Um, basically grew up in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, and that is where a lot of my, my mom's family lives and grandparents and cousins. And cousins were my best friends growing up and my siblings. Um, but yeah, Fort Wayne, Indiana, you know, um, grew up in a Christian home. Uh, my mother, Tammy, my, my father, Marvin, who folks are getting to know here recently here mm-hmm. at the church as he's now moved down here. Um, yeah. Well, let, me, then, let me pause you there because sure. I'm already curious about a couple of things. Okay. So mom's family was from Fort Wayne. Mm-hmm. Where was dad's family from? Marvin's family. So they're from all over the place. Um, but a lot of my, my dad's family is in Ohio, um, Columbus area. Mm. Okay. Uh huh. All right. So, so then Harding College. I, I don't mm-hmm. want to just breeze over that because mm-hmm. if your mom and dad met at a Christian college, mm-hmm. that's going to shape kind of the character of your home. So, what's the denominational background of Harding College, which then would lead to potentially what type of theological tradition are you born into? Yeah. So, so my family, both my mom mm-hmm. and dad, 
have connections to the Church of Christ background. So that is what the uh, the connection is there to Harding College. It's the Church of Christ denomination. Um, I did not grow up in that denomination per se. We we grew up in a non denominational church that had some loose ties to that movement. Um, but my I mean my parents grew up in churches where. Uh, you know, largely you didn't have any instruments or anything like that. There's mm. some very different dynamics to the Church of Christ denomination. Okay, so so and and that's really really helpful. So mm-hmm. Church of Christ, as you understand it, as you understand what your parents experienced, mm-hmm. uh, conservative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very uh, conservative, particularly with reference to worship. Mm-hmm. Um, can you recall from conversations that you've had with your parents or grandparents, like theological? uniquenesses mm-hmm. of the Church of Christ, particularly because our audience here mm-hmm. is going to be leaning more Baptist or right. more Reformed theologically. So, I mean, how would they, if they're not super familiar with the Church of Christ, where would the Church of Christ distinguish themselves theologically? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, um, so conservative worship is going to be a big piece. Um, you, you have, it's like it's like every denomination, not you have different sects, right? Um, but largely, you're going to have no instruments, vocals only. Um, the music program is very large at Harding College, right? Mm-hmm. And that's actually how my parents met was in chorus and choir. Mm. Um, a lot of acapella choral music, okay, um, being sung there. But but so the conservative worship piece, but then also some interesting views on baptism. Interesting mm. views on the role of baptism. Um, like borderline baptismal regeneration? Yes. 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 Um, and so depending on what, what stripe of Church of Christ you're connected to, um, there's going to be a lot of discussion on the emphasis, the importance of the actual physical act of baptism. Yeah. Um, and they're going to go to the book of Acts Sure. Passage after passage for that, right? Be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That that interwoven nature between the act of baptism and salvation. Yeah. yeah. So so whereas uh, particularly like in a Baptist background, mm-hmm. the danger might be we don't emphasize baptism enough mm-hmm. as a appropriate response to the gospel, mm-hmm. as something that should happen very close to one's conversion mm-hmm. and profession of faith mm-hmm. uh, we really if, if we're maintaining the integrity of the outlook of the book of acts we probably shouldn't perceive of people as being christians who have not been baptized mm-hmm. it's kind of not really in the paradigm of the book of acts right. that's where we might struggle in the baptist tradition it sounds like if i'm if i'm putting a positive spin on it yeah like like a good thing within the church of christ would be hey there is not a de-emphasis yes. of the importance of this Christian rite. You, mm-hmm. you could call it a rite. You could call it a sacrament. You could call it a uh, covenantal sign. Mm-hmm. Like They really emphasize you need to be baptized. Yeah. A lot of comfort with the idea that, you know, first, first and second Peter, baptism saves you thus, <laughs> right? Yeah. There's going to be a lot of comfort there. What would be your perception of the danger what would be what would make you a little bit nervous about signing up for that type of tradition as a as a grown man and now pastor? Yeah, or, I mean, for me and even things that my parents were beginning to see as I was young and as they started to kind of step back and assess that movement, you know, they're looking at other passages of scripture. They're looking at the whole counsel of God that then emphasizes the Spirit's work in salvation, justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, mm-hmm. right? Um, when, you, when you hold those, those narrative passages and acts along next to the epistles, right, the, the principal passages that talk about the way God saves mm-hmm. and what saves and what does not save, right, you're going to want to be careful to, to nuance those things rightly. Mm-hmm. Um, so in, if, if you, if you have the pendulum swing of what, what is baptism for, what does it do? You know, you, like, as you said, you might have a, a Baptist leaning that might, that might lean a little less toward the, um, the importance. It's, it's very much just a symbolic 
act um, you, on the other side of it, you would have the Church of Christ, which says, you know, if anything, they're going to err on the side of if, if you're if you're not able to be baptized, if you're not yet to the waters, if you haven't done the thing, yeah, you're not regenerated. You're not regenerated. You yeah. haven't gone through all the steps. Okay. Um, so I think that's kind of how yeah. I would. So then fast forward. I mean, I have so many more questions to ask you. You are a fascinating onion to peel. <laughs> but we move into, so you're growing up in Fort Wayne. In Fort Wayne. Mom and dad are Christians. Yep. Big family, small family. Where do you fall in birth order? I think that's important. We've got I a lot of the, folks that want to yeah. peg you as being, are you a firstborn? Are you a middle child? Are you the youngest child? Sure, sure. I am the middle child. I'm the middle child. I have an older sister and a younger brother. You, you so are a middle <laughs> child. <laughs> do I fit the, the description uh, of a... <laughs> a... Quiet, like uh, not necessarily demanding to be seen. Got nothing to comfortable prove. Comfortable to just kind of mm-hmm. float. Yeah, man. <laughs> I mean, we've all we've we've met Ryan. He's obviously the baby. <laughs> clearly, clearly, the baby, the baby of the family. <laughs> yeah, make sure he listens. To baby this. Ryan. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll send him a link. Yeah, for good, sure. Good. And of course, I've had the privilege of meeting your sister. Oh yeah, and she's got the strength of a firstborn. Yes, she does. So praise God for that. Okay, so a family of five total. Yep. Three siblings. Yep. Well, what's shaping you? Childhood. I mean, are you homeschooled, private school, public school? Public school. Public school through and through. Um, throughout elementary, middle school, high school, um, discipled by Rome. Fort Wayne, quite a bit, quite a bit, <laughs> to be honest with you. Yes, yes, uh, but but very much involved in the church. As I said, my parents were very. Was very there active. a church that that you think of as your home church? Yeah, so we went to a we went to a couple as I was young, but the the main one I remember is Christ Church at Georgetown up there in Fort Wayne. Um, again, some some loose affiliation with Church of Christ background, but basically a your standard non-denominational church. Right. Preaching a true gospel, really good people. Amen. I mean, that was my that was my childhood. And Praise we, God. You know, one of the reasons we moved to Fort Wayne, you know, my first couple of years, we were in Arkansas, then we were in Denver for a little while. Um but one of the reasons we wanted to come back to Fort Wayne is because my, my grandparents were there and my, my mom's siblings and my cousins and my parents wanted us to grow up around family. So okay. we were able to go to church together. I cool. Mean, so what every, a beautiful thing. Yeah. Every Sunday, you know, you got cousins coming over for lunch and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Like it, that was the culture of Praise God. childhood. Praise so, God. Yeah. It was, it was a blessing. Okay. So, so, how was your faith formed? And, and obviously, I know your parents are loving you and they're teaching you and you're learning things at mm-hmm. church and you're mm-hmm. probably involved in some type of uh, youth group or something like that within your church. But w- when do you feel uh, your faith was was formed or it crystallized or sure. do you have a sure. defining moment? So I, I mean, it was young. It was young. I was probably, I mean, I was, I was baptized at seven years old. Um, Praise God. And so my, my parents would tell you, I, I tell people all the time, it's, it's vague, it's hazy to me now. I don't have the best memory, but my parents would tell you, I, I had a pretty clear understanding of the faith. I, I tell people all the time, I don't, I don't remember a time in my life <laughs> where I was not feeling guilt for sin, a desire to seek forgiveness in God, mm. a reliance on Christ. Like those things are just baked into my praise God. Memory mm-hmm. of childhood. Would yeah. to God we all had that testimony. Yeah. yeah. Like that's you know, sometimes it's not flashy, right? Yeah. You know, you don't have this huge story of the bondage of sin and right. how Christ dramatically broke the chains and mm-hmm. rescued you from all of your vices. But what a powerful and joyful and really it should be the goal of every Christian parent yeah. Yeah. that God in his grace would impart to your child this this testimony where the, when they describe it, they're like, well, I've always believed. I, yeah. mm-hmm. I've always felt the conviction of my sin and known that when I sin, I turn to Christ. Yeah. He's the only one that can forgive me. Yeah. I've known that his word is true and I have always felt that life is there in his word. Like 
Yeah. As a preacher, man, those are <laughs> my favorite testimonies because uh, that means Satan had his clutches and did his damage. You know. Yeah. We want people to be uh, minimally under the influence. Of Absolutely. being lost and Absolutely. outside the kingdom. And and it took me, you know, it's taken me a long time to come to to that sort of a feeling about my sure boring testimony. Like for, for many years I felt like something was something was wrong, something was yeah. off. Like I heard I was listening to preachers on the radio saying, If you don't have a conversion story, I'll never forget it. On the radio, some some program. You don't have a conversion story. You don't have a conversion. Yeah. And a literal date and time. And, yeah. And I'm I'm sitting here lost. Like Lord, yeah. I I can't. Maybe I maybe I just don't re- recall a moment or a mm-hmm. day. But Lord, I, I I feel like we've been in this for a long time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I've uh, I, I, as as a fan of Spurgeon, mm-hmm. as much as I love Spurgeon, like one of the things that sometimes I wince at. Mm-hmm. in some of his sermons is he can lean pretty hard to this mm-hmm. what you're describing mm-hmm. that like there's an expectation that true conversion is always mm-hmm. some powerful you know vividly discernible mm-hmm. experience with God right and uh, that is how his conversion went and so many are and so many are yeah but um it doesn't the, the the unintended consequence is creating this effect possibly mm-hmm. in someone such as you mm-hmm. where it's like man do i need to go out and like sow some vices yeah, <laughs> so that i might then un get unsafe for a little bit yeah <laughs> so I can, so I can properly yeah. come to jesus yeah, yeah it's and yeah that has a, that has an impact um so we have to we have i've grown in in even recent years and my understanding that you can have a, a doctrine of regeneration, an actual, you know, justifying moment by the spirit where, where that moment has happened, has taken yeah. place. But that's a different thing than saying my ability in my flesh to recall it in, in every, you know, specific detail as young as I was. Those are two different things. Yeah, The, the but, story, and we got to be careful with biblical narratives, but the story that always helps me, helps me embrace God's freedom mm-hmm. to save mm-hmm. when and where and how he sees fit is you're reading through the Christmas narrative and you're reading about John the Baptist mm. and filled with a spirit from the womb man mm. Amen. and you're like all right can, can you yeah. even can you even postulate <laughs> the idea that we have a spirit filled child from the womb mm. is anyone going to dare say that that child is lost right 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 so so God can do what only God can do when and where and how and he answers to no one and he's absolutely free mm-hmm. because salvation is in and of him alone. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So uh praise God. Yeah. Praise God. Okay, so what I'm hearing you say is that's kind of your testimony. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. um baptized age seven, yep. but you you've felt a Christian at a young age and grew in that. Um, so here's, I think a natural question that a lot of our listeners would have would be, all right, John, they know you now. Mm-hmm. They know Jonathan, their pastor. Mm-hmm. They know Jonathan, the, I mean, theological nerd. Mm-hmm. They know Jonathan who uh, loves Jesus, unashamed of Jesus. They know that Jonathan, mm-hmm. like, were you always that way? Mm-hmm. So what's, Tell me a little bit about your Christian journey yeah. and, and how do we go from young man, Christian, finishes public school, goes off to Anderson University, studying graphic design. Mm-hmm. How do we go from that's kind of where you were to seminary yeah. to I want to be a preacher, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so don't leave out. Don't leave out the spiritual part of that journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what'd that look like? Yeah. I mean, so huge, huge part of my childhood is basketball, right? Mm. I mean. You're a Hoosier. I, I'm a Hoosier. Like, you're kind of short for that, to though. To the bone. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You're, 
you're tall, uh, <laughs> athletic. Uh, you, it would it have been sinful for your father here in Indiana to have not put a basketball <laughs> in your hand. And he knew that, and he had me in. I mean, we were in travel leagues in the summers from, I mean, fourth, gr- third or fourth grade, I think, through mm-hmm. third or fourth grade through freshman year of college. I was on the court more than I was not on the court, it wow. seems like, with travel leagues, school teams, and stuff like that. Um, spiritually in that, right? I'm in public school. I'm in public leagues. I'm in interacting with a lot of people outside the faith. Um, I had my church family, I had my family. Um, but most of my friends and people around me were not believers. We're not Hmm. in the faith. And I mean, my pretty consistent testimony was feeling like the only Christian around, you know, trying to I never, I never had, I never was big on the peer pressure thing. Like I I didn't, it did not bother me to not be the one at the party, not be the one at the, right. You're a middle child, man. I'm good, man. You're good. Like I'm going to do my thing. You guys, whatever works for you, (laughs) turn to Christ, but I'm going to be over here. (laughs) Yeah. Sort of a childhood. Um, I'm good with my family. Like just content sort of a thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, so, so because of that, right, that, um, you know, Satan, Satan has a way of, and your own flesh has a way you're, you're going to find certain sins appealing, certain mm-hmm. sins don't even sure. up on your radar, right? Sure. Yes. So more private sins, right? Yeah. Sexual sins and temptation and lust of the flesh and the eyes and different things like that are going to be more prone to somebody who's not. I mean, I would always classify myself as more of an introvert, content to be, you know, on my own at home, that sort of thing. Um, so that, you know, as I'm in middle school and high school and stuff, it may not be drugs and alcohol and right. all the big law breaking, all the big law break, big flashy grand sins. theft auto. Yeah. None of that. <laughs> no, no headlines. Right. Um, but other ways. Right. I was I was battling a lot of sin. Mm -hmm. I was battling a lot of sin um, in some unhealthy relationships and things like that throughout high school. um, And, you know, but but this is why I say the Lord was at work even from childhood is that I knew I knew I was in the wrong. Hmm. I knew I was, you know, building up callous over my my heart and grieving the Holy Spirit as I would go left instead of right and those sorts of things. And so, um, it was a constant battle. It was a constant, you know, spirit and flesh battle within me. Come to find out that's a Roman seven, very clear (laughs) reality. I didn't know that back then, but the Lord was at work leading and guiding. And so eventually I came to the point, okay, I'm in high school. I'm thinking about the future. Um, I never had a real clear, this is what I want to go do. This is what I want to go be. Sure. Um, I want to make a living. I want to use my gifts and skills. I was always artistic. And so Mm -hmm. I thought, you know what? Design, technology, these things seem to be up my alley. So let's pursue that as far as college goes. And let's try to do that in a Christian atmosphere. Okay. So public school through and through, maybe going to a Christian college, would get me around some good people, some good friends, build sure. some good relationships. I was ready to get out of Fort Wayne. And yeah. <laughs> cause you're, if you're in Fort Wayne, you're going to IU or Purdue, or you're staying in town, IPFW. I mean, that yeah. was that's what everybody's doing. So I was so ready you longed to, to come to the metropolis that was Anderson. Yeah, man. Anderson <laughs> was calling me, and I just, I had to come. Um, mm. you know, my mom came for a visit one time, and looked at like the music program and yeah i had i had they're met well known with, for their music yeah yeah um i had met with some of the coaches there about playing basketball okay and stuff like that and so i'm like yeah let's let's make that move so come down to anderson um and you know at that at that time i was in a an unhealthy relationship um she actually came with me to anderson and my thought was if I can get us both in a Christian atmosphere, maybe things will become healthy and good, mm. and we'll sail off into the sunset for Jesus. Sure, yeah, <laughs> with, yeah. 
didn't pan out that way. Um, freshman year was probably a yeah. It was it was a it was a dark season coming mm. out of high school, going into college. A lot of dreams were kind of shattered. A lot of hopes, mm. you know. Turns out there's sin in Anderson, just like there is in Fort Wayne. Okay, mm-hmm. who'd have thought? Um, so did you find uh, some of those things? You know, I, I've heard people say stories of like, particularly if they're coming from like a public school background, mm-hmm. they have this vision of what a Christian college might be mm-hmm. like. Mm-hmm. And they're just assuming like everybody's coming here for the same reason. We all want to chase after Jesus. Yes. This is going to be spirit. And then you get there and you're like, well, there, you mean there's people who are here who aren't Christians? And then oh, there's man. people who are here who grew up in Christian homes and they don't even want to be here, but someone's paying the bill for them to be here. Yes. And you get there and you're That's like, horrible. how, how different is this from yes. a public university? Is that what you're speaking of? One hundred percent. The disappointments. This is a this mm-hmm. is a this is a miniature version in so many ways, not completely, but in so many ways, this is a miniature version. I might as well just gone to IU. I might as well just sure <laughs> partied it up and done the, you know, and and if you want to find that, you'll find it. Sure, no matter where you go. Yeah. Um, and so that that, that was discouraging, right? The relationship I was in ended and I was I was just in a dark place I hadn't you know in that first first year for semester or two I was I was really focused on school and basketball and her at the time mm-hmm. and so I didn't I hadn't really invested in friendships or meeting yeah you know solid guys to, to yeah and again as an introvert that was never really a, a goal that was never really something I had a couple friends growing up, but not a ton, nobody real close, um, or anything besides family. So freshman year was a, was a dark time, but the Lord was faithful as he always is. And he, he, um, we, we became closer than we'd ever been me and the Lord (laughs) in that dark season early Often college how it works, right? where I mean there's nobody to turn to and here I am huh. living on my own now um and and here's the Lord with arms wide open saying we're gonna get we're gonna get through this and so it, it, it ended up being a a beautiful season of growing in in a love for his word mm-hmm. consistently and faithfully mm-hmm. um you know I'm I'm forced to you know, create some new, build some new relationships. And so I meet guys, guys you've met, right. Some of my good friends from from college that, um, will end up being in my wedding in a few years from that point. And, um, you know, guys who are fighting similar battles that I'm fighting against sin, um, and yet are there for you and we're, we're chasing the same Lord. So, so there was a, a, a beauty in coming to that Christian community. It just wasn't as glorious as I, sure. <laughs> as I might've sure. expected Yeah, coming in. Um, so now what year at AU do you meet Kelsey? So then I meet Kelsey in 2008. So it was my, that was my sophomore year. Mm-hmm. She was a junior mm. and would not have, I know, right. Would not have um, would not have met her had it not been for my friends. Okay, had it not been for my buddies, who you know I'm content to sit around on the weekend and just read, watch TV, whatever. And my friends are like, "Dude, it's time to look into a, come come with us to this social club thing." I'm like, "Guys, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, yeah. Leave me alone. Let me." And they kind of force me, and I'm like, "All right, I'll go." So Anderson has these social clubs, right? Their version of a Christian fraternity sorority thing. Yeah. Um, and so you meet people there, and the uh, the rush week, right? Your initiation week. You've got brother and sister clubs, Tavis and Camrata, and there's Kelsey, and some we've got some mutual friends um, at that time, and so our paths begin to cross and. Mm. There you go. Yeah, 2000, 2008, 2009. Did you ask her out or did she ask you out? So we, <laughs> honestly, we were we were f- friends. We were both kind of seeing other people at the time. Mm. We were genuinely friends. 
for a good season really? at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I kid you not. We, we were both, um, you know, <laughs> we had again, mutual friends and stuff and, and our paths would cross, but we were, we were just good friends. So what we changed were, that? We were helping each other through each other's breakups and I mean, that kind of stuff and and mm-hmm. you know before you know it man the lord uh <laughs> let me help you with that breakup <laughs> the, lord, <laughs> the lord makes it very clear that hey you know everything you're looking for um right here right here mm-hmm. in a future bride um and so you know we we start spending time together with with our friends and um we go to this this little country place called frankfurt that i've never heard of and turns out that's where she grew up out on a gravel road in the country and uh Hmm. you know i'm meeting her family and i'm seeing how she interacts with her mom and dad but you're not officially no this is just as a friend here's my friend jonathan yeah yeah little john as they call him (laughs) (laughs) that's right that's right a whole group of us you know my buddy patrick and judah and everybody we're we're just a group of friends and we're hanging out and at some point the lord made it clear that uh buddy you need to <laughs> you need to make a move here so i asked her out um we Is that we, junior year so that would have been that would have been my soft end of my sophomore end of sophomore end year. of my sophomore okay. year um and yeah you know we start spending time together at where the lord had both of us i think was we we were ready to have serious conversations future conversations what are you looking for in a family what are you looking for Mm -hmm. for christ how do you want to serve what you know Mm -hmm. those sorts of things um and and yeah i mean we we knew pretty early on that that we're going to be married someday um Mm. so So is that that 2008 that is 2000, end of 2008, early 2009 is okay. when we... And you guys would get married when? We didn't get married till 2012. So 2012. we both finished school. Um, she finished before I did. I, I, did, a, I did a victory lap in, in college. I did a did you squeeze year. five into four? I did, man. Was, <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> nice. I pulled that off. Uh, <laughs> praise be to God. But um, it's because I changed majors early on, and of I course. wasted time. It was of course ah ah to do over. Um, and and also, you know, we were also kind of under that that influence of you can't get married until you finish school. Like sure, you mm-hmm. have to wait, right? Yeah, and and yeah, we kind of bought that. So we so we waited um, to do it over again. We would not have, but yeah. But yeah, so once we're we're both done with school, um, we we get married the week after my graduation. Um, Good for you. And I move in. She had already moved to Castleton area. She was doing a nanny job there, and we um, we get married, move in. Okay, and, so yeah. that that's that's a beautiful like kind of account of what's going on. So you're you're newly married, mm-hmm. living in Castleton. Wife's got a job. You're getting a job. Mm-hmm. How do you go from, I'm an early career graphic designer mm-hmm. to, I think the Lord, I think the Lord may be leading me to ministry. <laughs> well, thank you all for tuning in to this installment of the NBC After Hours podcast. So far, we have talked about Jonathan's upbringing, his testimony, how he was uh, converted from an early age, and it has been such a blessing to hear the testimony from him. And next week, what we're going to hear is how the Lord ended up calling Jonathan into the ministry and how Jonathan joined uh, the ministry, became a pastor. We're going to check that out next week. So if you want to be in the know for that episode, be sure to hit the subscribe button. Hit that little bell icon if you're on YouTube and uh, be sure that you are following along. When these episodes are released, they're released every Friday at 6.30 a.m. on the dot every week. So, I uh, hope this episode was a blessing to you and I look forward to finishing off this conversation next week. God bless.